Um, I'm six. I'm married. I have two teenage daughters. Um, you all know I probably will mention my family while I'm here because they're easy to use examples. I always check them before I do a talk that what they have for me to dispose. Uh, I have a 40, nearly 14 year old daughter called Lily. Um, she doesn't have a diagnosis, but she's quite happy with the fact that she is. We're quite happy with the fact that she is autistic. I have a 15 year old. She also doesn't have a diagnosis. Um, but we're fairly sure she's more typical. We still love her. She's amazing. <laughs> she's, our, she's our special case in our family because she's without autism. Um, and my husband doesn't have a diagnosis of anything, but he's always happy for me to say that when I first met him, he spoke in quotes. Everything he said was a movie quote, and I haven't watched him in the same movies in quotes, so that's kind of it. And he has um, so a certain knowledge of anything to do with small check and next generation. Think of that one. Okay. I'm a nutrition coach. I tend to work mostly with autistic adults, um, which seems to be very nicely. Um, and I'm also a research student. I've just started this year and I'm looking at health of autistic adults, particularly people's experiences of how they manage their own health. And I'm just autistic. So that's me. Uh, any questions around that before we move on? Everyone happy with that? After a bit, my, I'll start to talk a little bit slower, but the adrenaline's kicked in and I'm speaking a bit. Sorry about that. What I really like working on in my practice is, is autism plus environment equals the outcome. Has anyone come across that statement before? Yes. Yeah. Luke, he comes here. He comes here, yeah. Luke. Yeah, yes. I really, this is my favourite, favourite thing to work with. It's, it covers so many different things. Um, I know that everybody has a very different view of what autism is, so I'm going to go through what my kind of, how I see it, which is just processing information differently from most of the general population, whether that's communication, about sensory issues or concepts and ideas. I don't know about you lot, but I tend to find that all of those bits of information I process differently from most of the people I come into contact with over time. Um, then we've got good, good examples of those for processing communication differently. Then I had chatty a lot like that, but I didn't ask questions. No, none of that. Sensory. I know you're all going to have sensory changes, how you process sensors. Anyone got good examples? I'm very quiet today. Yeah, you haven't had much sugar yet. Okay, I'm going to go through this. So, communication, for me particularly, um, I'm very comfortable, and it's a lot of autistic people in the room. I met up with a group of autistic women for the first time a couple of years ago. I got my diagnosis in 2016. And what I found was amazing was that communication was for the first time nice and easy. So, having gone from having to really second guess myself at the time, to being in a group of people who we just move differently, we use facial expressions differently, our body language is different, and I thought, oh, this is easy, this is so much easier, it's less of a stress, this is what it must be like for most of the time. Sensory things, for me it tends to be sound. Um, I've had my ear defenders on for most of the journey, and I've often got this yellow, does anyone else use little yellow glasses to block out blue light? You haven't got some. You do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they can be amazing. They can make them. Oh, out blue lights. Blue light, yes. So we'll talk a little bit more about blue light as we go on, actually, because that's going to be quite crucial to this talk. For me, I find that they can block out a lot of my headaches that I get when there's too much kind of really fluorescent light. Uh, concepts and ideas. It's one of those things where if you've got anything that needs solving that you have a group of new typical people that are going, can't really think, ask an autistic person, because that's always come in with a different um, answer and a different way of looking at things. So that's how I view autism. Uh, so we have autism plus environment. External environments, nice and easy one to work with. You've probably all come across these. It's when we have got to struggle with lights, sounds, smells, tastes, textures, other people, changes in routine or expected events, and pressure to modify your own behaviour, are all examples of the, when the environment is not very easy for us to manage. So when we've got autism, plus the environment, we're going to end up with a slightly different outcome from how most people would uh, look at it. But what I'm particularly interested in as a healthy nutrition coach is our internal environment. If you have issues with things like food allergy, intolerance or sensitivity, or you have inflammation of any kind, uh, if you've got particular gut issues going on, like gut bacteria function, or you have pain issues, um, or you have chronic long-term illness, or you don't balance your sugar very well, or you have hormonal imbalances, 
All those things can have exactly the same effect as going to that place where the lights are too bright or the sounds are too much. All of them have the same kind of effect. And what they do is they make us super stressed. So everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. I am still going quite fast. You're doing well to keep up. So, let's go back. If I find that sounds are too noisy, I had this a uh, couple of weeks back when I was at university. Everything just got too much, and I went into meltdown because there was too much sound going on the room around me, and the light got too bright. I can have exactly the same effect from if I've had a loaf of sugar, and then a little bit later, uh, yeah, I'm going to because that was the slide before. A little bit later, then I have a real sugar crunch. It can have exactly the same effect, and I can still end up with a meltdown or a shutdown. And that's largely to do with these two stress hormones here, adrenaline and cortisol. Hello. Hi. Forgive me for being pretty blunt and flippant, but is this going to be a lecture on the dangers and evils of sugar and Absolutely how we should stay away from it? Because I've heard so much about from my dad that it just makes me angry at this point. Okay. Don't trust me. I get the same lectures for my mum. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, no, what, um, not so much the evils and the dangers of, but to explain how uh, sugar can make a difference for some of us, in fact everybody probably, not just autistic people, but most people. So it's more to explain how it makes the change. I don't ever tell anyone to not have sugar, it's not worth it. I have to split stages when I eat huge, huge amounts. But for me I find life a lot easier when I'm not having so much sugar, so it'll come into it but there'll also be lots of other things. It's not sugar itself, it's how we balance sugar within ourselves, rather than just the sugar intake. Is that going to be all right? Yeah, like stress, stress eating is one of the things that I do to calm down when I have a loud thing yes. or a bright thing or a migraine. Just do you know the biological reasons for why that happens? Uh, I don't, but I know it's a healthier habit than, say, cocaine or... So, <laughs> right. so what I'm going to explain is how that changes our biology, rather than saying that, uh, that we shouldn't have it yet. Yeah. I'm not going to tell anyone to have it. Otherwise, oh, there isn't there. There was no mm -hmm. cake. When there was cake, <laughs> there was all be left there. I don't want that to be. I really like cake. But it's really just to explain how that makes a difference to other things that are going on with us at the time. Okay? Uh, adrenaline. Does so everyone know what adrenaline is what it feels like? Um, so, adrenaline. It's a really fun factor hormone. It's that one that kicked in just before I stood up, uh, which meant that my voice went super squeaky. I'm hoping it's gone down a bit more, talking a little bit quieter. What it does is it gets the blood pumping in order to get you moving. So if you're in a dangerous position, you get this nice flow of adrenaline through your body and everything just goes. It means you can run away from the threat. Uh, for me, it means if I hear, does anyone else do this? If you hear a police siren, do you talk to your knees? <laughs> you do that. Not to my knees, but I do because my ears will close my eyes. Yeah, it's, and it can really set up, you can feel your heart rate going just from somebody else's. Um, oops. Sorry? 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 Yeah, that was bad. I don't try. <laughs> There's probably a good reason for that. Um, and also, if you wake up in cold sweat from a nightmare as well, um, that's often that kind of adrenaline surge going through because you've done something bad. But how about cortisol? Does anyone know what cortisol does? Uh, it's a stress hormone that is exuded when depending on which kind of stress situation you're in. It's short term to acute and long term to chronic. Excellent. That man there knows what he's talking about. I did my dissertation on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no pressure for me though, thank you so much. So there's a few ways that cortisol works. The general idea, when it works as a stress hormone, rather than as a sugar hormone, which we'll talk about in a bit, is that it's slower acting than adrenaline. And what it does is it releases glucose into our bloodstream so that it could run that a little bit further, or we can keep fighting if we need to. If we just have adrenaline, then we'd be like a big explosion of things going on, and then we'd just be tired. Um, but what cortisol also does is we have naturally higher levels in the morning, so we can get going for the day, and lower at night for tissue rebuilding, mental processing, and counteracting inflammation. Those things can't happen when our cortisol is too high. I'm going to keep moving through, but we're going to keep coming back to that soon. We'll have to remember what time we For everybody, when a stressful internal or external environment triggers a cortisol release, your brain function becomes temporarily impaired. Not just you, but it really is everybody. However, when we add autism to the mix, then we put it a little bit harder than this one. Because some people can manage that autism release, or the other people can have actual problems. Or probably most people in this room, it's going to be a lot harder to pick. So, here's what high cortisol does when it's too high. You can end up with issues with your short-term memory. 
speech and sensory processing, your mood and your behaviour regulation, animal organising, which some of you might know as executive function, making good judgments, insomnia, and meltdowns and shutdowns. To give you an example of that, the first time I did one of these talks, so I know my stuff fairly well for this, but I finished the talk, got a lift home, and even though I knew I've got loads of really good healthy food in the house, something in my head said, I can't prepare that, I'm too stressed from this, I'll get pizza for everybody. Five minutes later, my husband found me in front of the cabinet with pizzas in, sobbing with tears, because I couldn't choose what pizzas to get. I couldn't make judgments, I couldn't plan myself to work out which ones to get out of the uh, My mood and behaviour regulation had just gone, I don't know why I found that particularly so emotional. Couldn't quite tell in the words, because my speech was not gone as well. And really I was feeling those lights and positive much more than I normally would. Um, so all those things can go quite quickly if you have got a strong release of cortisol. But you'll know this, because you know your cortisol. Uh, we have a natural cortisol cycle as well. Just so you know, I'm going to go through the floors and have a look at that way to come make things you're after. Our cortisol levels are higher naturally in the morning about 8 o'clock. What that's doing is put that little bit of sugar into our bloodstream to go get up, go out, go hunt. We didn't have those, so if we hadn't had those, we wouldn't make it up in the morning at all. We'd just be lying in bed going, oh, I can't do anything. Um, so from ancestral times, having that little cortisol so would meant that we could go out and we could get ourselves food for the day and we'd actually survive. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I just did very well on my own car. <laughs> <laughs> However, during the day, our food intake, and sunlight and their activity levels help us to maintain that energy so we don't have to have so much cortisol in our system. What happens is short so it peaks at about 8 o'clock in the morning, throughout the day it goes lower, 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 so that at night time those cortisol levels do have to be nice and low, otherwise we don't really see that we don't sleep too well. Can I have a show of hands, people who don't sleep too well? Yeah, of so. Doesn't exist. And that may well, I'm not saying it is, but it's Although possibly. Although my kids have got a brain that doesn't shut up. Doesn't break us. Oh, Say, mate, unless you have to put on YouTube in the background just to get my brain to concentrate on something else while I first sleep. And for the same people, how many people have trouble getting up in the morning? I don't. So, I don't actually, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I actually haven't had trouble getting up until I moved house. Oh, <laughs> I might not get up after a long time. Yeah, I'm not that's a bit different, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody should have to get up at that time. Yeah. But what should happen is by 8 o'clock, everybody should be really kind of bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to kind of hit the day. Most people don't tend to have that, and I think that's lovely to do your conscious analysis. Do you expect it to be like that stage of the morning again? <laughs> <laughs> if it's any consolation, uh, I used to sleep for about three hours every night, and I was really sleepy throughout the day, so I had to like at least twice during the day. Um, this morning I was bouncing out of bed, that's bouncing, that's fine actually. I was certainly bouncing out into my subway by 6, but I had 10 to 7 trains to get in this morning. Um, so there, there is going to be in the sun. Here's the problem. Every single time we eat sugar, we disrupt our natural 24 hour cortisol cycle. This is the reason why I am bouncing out hands. When we eat sugar, we get a little surge of sugar into our bloodstream. I am going to be simplifying this, so I'm really sorry, your dissertation is going to be way uh, more than this. <laughs> well, no, my dissertation is on the effects of music on the fish, so I think it's uh, not a science. <laughs> Similar, okay then. I, there's no fish in my talk. No, there's fish on the spot. There's no fish in the talk. I just turned out they like Slayer more than Mozart. <laughs> okay. I'm not joking, it had significantly reduced cortisol levels with the uh, current every time. <laughs> 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 so, um, okay, so we have a little peak of blood sugar in our food, <coughs> what happens? So we use up that energy quite quickly, and then insulin steps in. Everyone heard of insulin? That one steps in because if those sugar levels in our blood are too high, it's really, really dangerous. So insulin steps in, and so the amount of sugar or glucose in our bloodstream drops, 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 drops. Then our body goes, hang on, our blood sugar levels are too low. So what it does is it cranks up the cortisol in order to get your uh, sugar going back into our bloodstream so we have enough energy. So what it's doing is literally saving our life that cortisol. Throughout the day, if you have some sugar and then your stress levels go down, sorry, and then your sugar levels go down and it goes up, and you have this pattern, 
what you don't have is that pattern we talked before. We have that lovely big peak in the morning, and then it goes off. We should only have that really happening once a day. So if we are able to have less sugar than these other forms of energy, we don't quite have those peaks and troughs in the same way. And um, we'll talk about why that's being a those little troughs are what can really push some of, some of us who are autistic over the edge. Uh, for me personally, having that little sh sugar you know, rise and then it peaking down, you know, peaking and then dropping right down can be so incredibly stressful. That's the time I'm most likely to shut down the meltdown if because my blood sugar levels are too low. And that's because everything biologically in my body is going, whoa, sugar levels are too low, you might die. So we feel that in our bodies, and that tells our brains that there's something dangerous. If we, if we don't have that sugar bit, and then we don't have that trough, that's less likely to happen. I'm not saying it won't happen, because you'll still have all those external environment things in trouble. So for me, well, that light, some, so the lights, for some of you it might be the sounds, for some of you it might be having to change how your behaviour works. Is everybody with me so far? Yes. Any questions at all before we move on? Uh, yeah, can I just it? ask one? Hey. So, the big question. Can I just ask one? We have questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, is it, could you just say the difference between um, hypoglycemia and diabetes? If it's relevant. Uh, I think the best way to describe it. Is if we're talking about diabetes 1 or diabetes 2, I'm going to ignore the 1. I don't really know. Okay, diabetes 2 is the one that you can develop. It tends to be with people who have quite a lot of sugar that their body eventually, it produces the insulin, but the insulin that's helping to put that sugar in our cells doesn't work. It, uh, so it doesn't work. Our cells stop recognising that signal, right. so that we end up with a lot of blood sugar in our bloodstream, so we have to add an extra insulin to bring those levels back down again. Because as I said before, those high sugar levels cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. Does that help a bit? Yeah, so does, yeah. hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia. Is when your levels have got too low. So all the time you've got this balancing act of insulin bringing the levels down, cortisol bringing them up again, insulin bringing it down. Does that help? Yeah. They, 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 as, as, as medical conditions, they're two distinct things. I'll take it. They tend to come with the same, the same people are likely to suffer the same things. Is that all right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's one of those ones that's... I'm going to go home and go, oh, I really want to that really bad. By the way, um, I will give out my email details if anybody wants to email me with questions after that. I'm more than happy that. Right, more questions. There was somebody else. Just, uh, are you talking about uh, artificial sugar or all sugar? You must not even ah, at all. Okay, um, so sugar in the form of glucose. So that's any forms of <coughs> white sugar that you get in supermarkets. <laughs> it's honey, it's maple syrup, it's all fruit, which is glucose and fructose, cause a similar kind of reaction. Artificial sweeteners are a little bit different. Uh, we don't treat those in the same way in our body. They're actually not great either for both reasons. So when I talk about sugar, I'm only talking about this, those forms of sugar that would tend to give you some energy. Does that help? I am. Is it worth pointing out that starches are in fact just glucose? We will come to that in a second. Well, it was just with you mentioning the fruits and things, but then not mentioning vegetables. I just. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I promise not to leave that one out. Um, okay, was there anything based on this bit so far? Can I ask? Yeah. I'm an, I work at night, so, but I don't do regular nights, so I'm kind of. They, they put me on. So I do say two nights, and then I might have six nights off. Then it's really that, and then I might just have one night, and then one night off, and then two nights. So my 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 body's all mixed up. It will be. It will. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually very little you can do about that, other than support it as best you can. Absolutely. So in about five minutes, sleep. So I'm going to go yeah. into some ways that you can improve that. So it is really good to be working on this anyway. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so does anybody know the answer? To, uh, give me a, a, a one sentence that covers this. How do we reduce stress, reduce sugar cravings, and improve our sleep? Stop eating. Stop eating. <laughs> no, don't do that. Nobody stop eating. Play any more Pokemon. Exercise. Hey, mind, just shut the hell up. It doesn't, doesn't work in my case. Yeah, it doesn't work for me either. The answer is literally we focus on regulating our cortisol cycle. 
it, it's actually quite a simple one. I've got about the next 10 slides or so we're going to give you ideas for how to help regulate the cortisol cycle. Don't blame Andrew the Gathering, you're stressed, you are young boy. Do not do the guy you mission to the them hearts, they won't destroy you. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so regulating the cortisol cycle is something that 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, people just had nice regulated hormones because everything was fixed the right way for them. It wasn't the lights were where they, hang on, they were sleeping at night time, they were out during the day, their activity levels, the food that was available didn't coincide to cause these problems. So what I'm going to do now is give you a list of suggestions of ways to help support your cortisol cycle. I always recommend that people don't go, oh, I'll take all those ideas, how about how we do them in one go. It would be very, very confusing for your body. It would be very difficult to manage yourself. So what I suggest is if you take one slide today that you find is useful, great, go with that. Or email me with things that you, you know, questions that you've got. Um, otherwise it gets really, really difficult. The first one is morning light. Um, it's tricky this time of year because the light is coming up later and later and later. The more sunlight you have going in your eyes and onto your skin in the morning, they signal to your body that it's time for that cortisol just to gently start rising to give you that energy to get up and going for the day. So anyone who's in a house where the curtains are drawn until they really get up and going for the day, or or they're not being able to get up to later, all those who have to work nights, that does get really quite tricky. So what I suggest is in the mornings, get the curtains open as early as you can so you start to get that directly to sunlight. Even better, try and get outside as early as you can. If you don't have much light in the morning, or you need quite a lot of light in the morning, you can get light boxes, they're not cheap. Um, but what they do is they give you a blue spectrum of light, which just tells your body, this is sunlight, it's time to get up and get moving for the day. Any questions around that slide? I promise that these are the masses that we've got all and the lights 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 and the Daylight bulbs are amazing. Yes. Really, really well coming about diagrams. They're not daylight bulbs, they're daylight bulbs. They're daylight bulbs. They're daylight bulbs. Brilliant. Did everyone hear that? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so you can get some bulbs that are actually more conducive to, it's more similar to actually the light that you get in the morning. There's a question from Ron on this, but with yeah. regard to what, what was like 100 years ago, the working week was very different 100 years ago, because again, the idea of the Saturday wasn't, uh, the Saturday off didn't come in until Ford said that, so gave it, and then other businesses took that on board. It was the not having the same lighting in the households, uh, and the, Come back to me on that one at the end. Let's go through these ones and then do answer that. Do give me that question again. Okay, so morning lights are really important. So on the other side of that, evening lights. So blue light in the evening. So that's lights from our phone screens, from computer screens, from <coughs> a lot of lighting systems that we have in our house, particularly if you happen to be going to something like a supermarket in the evening, with those horrendous blue lights that come and shine at you. All of those will tell your body that it's still daytime, it's still time to be awake, and therefore you still need a little bit of cortisol to keep your energy levels up. You really don't want high cortisol in the evening, in fact, when you want to be switching off. So if you're able to, take the lights down on your computer screens. Uh, most computers have got certain apps and things you can use to get the light on, or even on a smartphone or something, just take that light right, right, right down in the evenings. Or, which Sarah's modeling for people, and get yourself some of those mighty yellow glasses. Those are amazing for cutting out that really bright light in the evening. I've got some, but those gaming glasses usually on if you can find them online. And if at all possible, I know it's not possible for a lot of people, turn off as many screens as we can about an hour before you go to sleep. Um, some people do actually need something on, whether they need the sound or they need to come to get themselves to sleep. But for the majority of us, Having that screen on at night time and that extra source of light can actually stop our brains from recognising it's night time and we need to sleep. Any questions around that one? Okay. Don't look at this slide. <laughs> but in general, <laughs> avoiding sugar does make a huge difference. So, you know I said earlier that I used to sleep about three hours a night and then was drowsy throughout the day. When I cut out sugar, I now sleep. My, I sleep as soon as my head gets the pillow. Uh, usually from about half nine till about six in the morning. I'm absolutely out of the count, and I am awake in the day, and I don't need to nap those days. And that's because I don't touch sugar at all. 
I'm going to say starches, I have very few of those as well, but sugar is the main one which can set off those anxiety things that just mean that your, your cortisol levels do go out of whack. Reason being, when your sugar levels, just to remind you, when your sugar levels in the bloodstream are high, you're going to need to produce extra insulin to lower them again. The body treats that drop in sugar as an emergency situation. And so your, what your body does, reduce, brings the right cortisol, bring your levels back up again. Okay, so sugar is an internal environmental stressor. Hello there. Is there going to be a bit when you tell us what's high and what's low? How do you know what is high for you and what is high for your... The cortisol levels. The sugar levels. The sugar levels. That's you just not know what they could be. Take the hormone plus the diabetic. Yes, there is that. So the levels I don't tend to work with because I tend to work with symptoms of people, so I do very I don't tend to work with lab results and those things. Yeah. I'm really in a more practical sense. I mean, are you are you sort of saying I don't know, is it in the three bags of all pieces? Got you. Okay. <laughs> so that's usually dependent on the person. So I will have some clients that I will say literally if you can take out all sugar and a lot of other products in your diet, that would work for you better. I've got some who can just say, well, I'll have a little bit of honey, I'll have a little bit of soup, and they're fine on that. It's when they're having huge amounts of biscuits and cake, which set off those awful cravings that we need more sugar and more cake. Does that help a bit? Yes, it does. Hello, can I use myself as an example? I, I can't eat a potato without having a sugar crash. There are too many carbohydrates in a potato for me. So I think, it, as Flo says, it's very much about knowing yourself. If you know that you feel a bit jittery, if you know that you crash, my speech goes, I want to fall asleep. Um, I'm extraordinarily sensitive to all carbohydrates at all. But I know lots of other people, my partner here, can eat biscuits till they come out of his ear rolls. Nothing bad ever happens. It's just unfair. <laughs> 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 Tell me about it. <laughs> it never puts on a pound either. <laughs> Jealous. Yeah. 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 It's it's really it's very such a lovely visual though. <laughs> I'm not going to agree with that one. Can I clarify on We eat lots of sugar. Insulin gets a little bit about that, and then that causes the drug. Yes, exactly that. I, I do repeat, I go through it so fast, so sometimes I do need to keep checking, but it's exactly that. Has everybody got that now? Everybody happy with how it works? I'm presumably flow, it's essential sensitivity in the way that all senses might be impacted on. So, you know, some people like really loud noises, yes. some people don't like really loud noises. So presumably there's an internal sensory sensitivity difference that's going to be different with everyone in the room. I don't see this one as being a sensory issue, no. just a hormone issue. It's literally hormone. Yeah, I'm just thinking that way through. Yes, this is so when I'm talking about this one, it will be purely a hormonal change. As opposed to sensory issues which can cause a hormonal issue, yeah. this is the hormonal issue itself. Yeah. Is that alright? Yeah, thanks, yeah. Mark. Right. Yeah. Okay. The next one is tiny when your nutrients are. Um, there's ways of supporting a natural cortisol cycle. Um, what I would always say is the morning is one of the worst times to have sugar. If you can, if there's a time of day when you want to have sugar, you want to have that late at night when your body catch can manage to react to that a little bit better. In the morning, I will be going for a really high fat smoothie usually or something like that. Or I'll have loads of eggs and vegetables. I'll have huge amounts of butter. For me, fat is what gets me going in the day. If I have sugar for breakfast by 9 o'clock, I want to sleep again. Um, having less sugar throughout the day. But in the evening, those starches that Sarah was saying about, all that potatoes, all that rice, all of that starchy vegetables, if you're going to have those at any time of the day, that's the best time to have it. It just reassures your body that everything's okay and it's time to sleep. Okay, is everyone happy with that? So, it, as with all things, I rarely say to people, don't have something. But I would say, think about when it suits your body best to have them. We've heard a lot from the government of things on how we shouldn't have sugar at a certain time of the day, usually at night time because that of course is putting weight in a different way. Actually our bodies don't work that way. It's basically very, very full evidence. The key thing is the best time to have some carbohydrates if you're going to have some. Earlier on in the day is not so good. Any questions on this one? Oh yeah, hi. So yeah, for breakfast I have coffee with free sugar and cocoa box. I think that wakes me up, so that's not a good idea to do. 
it will be waking you up a lot for probably about 45 minutes. Yeah, then I'm tired. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what can I do to that? Okay. So, other ideas for breakfast things. Eggs are great. If anybody, I know a lot of people have a lot of sensory issues with eggs, or they can be quite allergen. But if people can manage eggs and wipe them, they're a great thing to have for breakfast. If you have bacon, sausages, go for it. Um, something like a smoothie that's got quite a lot of fat in, something like coconut oil or some avocados or something added, great. Some people, so we always say that we're supposed to have breakfast. Some people actually don't suit having breakfast at all. It's totally fine. If you don't want to have breakfast, not everybody needs it. And that's actually okay. It's one of those people, oh, you've got to have your breakfast. You don't. There's, there's no rule that says that we should at all. Thank you. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, breakfast things on the Every try I That's really interesting. Did everyone get that? No. no. Um, apparently in the military you used to get charged if you didn't have breakfast. If you failed to get breakfast in the military and you, um, something happened, you'd be charged for missing the parade. Okay. Breakfast is a parade. That <laughs> seems to be a meal, which is yeah. mandatory. And they, they still actually do it, so we go up to catch it because it happened in the military. So that's good to see as well. Yeah, good idea. We, we still have to be there for breakfast. It's so breakfast. <laughs> Unless any, the rest of you are military, you do not need breakfast. <laughs> Can I suggest if you say, if it doesn't make breakfast, don't go into the military. It might be seen quite far again. Quite harsh. Yeah, because that's why I'm not sure. And actually, people who don't manage sugar uh, breakfast very well in the morning are often more alert until they've had that first. <coughs> Does anybody find that like, they can be more alert first thing in the morning, but once they eat, they feel drowsy? Yeah. 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 Ah, that tends to be the carbohydrates again. So if that's anything sugar or um, fruit based things or something like potatoes, or rice, or chips, bread, all the things that most people like. You get that lovely sense of energy for usually about half an hour, and then you're like, yeah, I can really deal with a nap. Okay. Let's go the next one. Caffeine. Who needs caffeine to wake up in the morning? I'm surprised there isn't more. Hands up if you can manage caffeine in the evening and still sleep. Damn, really? Okay. But the majority of people. <laughs> which and does not work in this room at all. Most people, if they have caffeine, usually after about two in the afternoon, the quality of their sleep really isn't that good. So if you do have issues with sleeping at night, it's often worth looking to see whether caffeine is actually suiting you, or whether you'd be better off with a different kind of drink in your class. Um, it's on decaf. Right, depending on your brand, some decaf uh, coffees still actually have some caffeine, they just have less caffeine. So it's worth trying all the kind of coffee you've got. If you're having some decaf in the evening and you're still sleeping really well, it's probably all right. Yeah. But there are some that can leave you really, really jittery, and that might be the caffeine in it, but also some coffee beans aren't great. There's extra caffeine in there that you don't want. Hello. There's also caffeine in hot chocolate. There is. And Ovaltine chocolate. Okay, so I was told to avoid these things. Um, I was told to give myself an Ovaltine, but you wouldn't drink that, so I've got the chocolate one. So chocolate's got a little bit less caffeine in the coffee. Uh, coffee is really, really is the highest of the high. But you're right that the people, if people have quite a strong caffeine sensitivity, then any caffeine is going to knock them over. And chocolate can be. Yeah, nice and literally just goes faster. Um, and any one of those energy drinks, I I would recommend avoiding those. Caffeine in those is a lot higher than coffee. Lots of they came over me at a meter from the 16 to get them. Say that again, sir. Paul came over me at a meter to get uh, energy drinks from the 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think that has actually happened. Okay. Yeah. 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 Or translation, Jamie Oliver declares war on emails. And actually, <laughs> actually, Morrison's has a block on the tail, so the, it doesn't matter if you're 101, they still need a. Okay, you're buying an energy drink. Ooh. Oh, good. Cool. It's also to check out as an annoying enough. <laughs> <laughs> I put the item on there. Recognise it. <laughs> so yeah, energy drinks are are not great. They they do give you that little initial surge of, of um, energy, but 
that tends to go on for a bit. I oh, oh, like it tastes like crap. I do. Yeah, I don't, I've never tried them. I do quite well on an energy drink. Make it sound really bad. Um, because it, how long do you feel writing them for? So well, I have to work the whole night, so I seem to be high as a kite for the whole night. <laughs> okay, so what they're doing is they <laughs> it's, it's that slight difference between caffeine and sugar. They'll give you that little bit of sugar release, but it's the caffeine itself that will keep you high. Kind of, I kind of crack jokes even more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll come back to you. So I can breathe in Coca Cola. Yeah. <laughs> Not Coca Cola, no. But <laughs> as, a, as a comparison, how, how much caffeine is tea got? It depends on the brand. I don't actually know the figures. Um, I guess I would probably tend to think it was in roughly half. But I don't actually know that. You know, right. have those ideas in my head. Three I was, was going to back in the 1980s, it used to be said that a, a standard tea bag had 55 milligrams of caffeine, a cup of instant. Uh, coffee had 60 milligrams of caffeine and one that you made yourself in the a decanting thing had about 120 milligrams of caffeine so the the normal jar what's it coffee was very similar to tea but the proper coffee was about double was that decaf? no that was just normal coffee <laughs> not that you know what about the caffeine levels in the green tea that uh, the soil would get in the pan? Not so much. Because they give you, when I'm out there, they gave you they a sweet to go with it, because it's, it's very bitter. It's, I'm wondering, so I'm wondering if you get tons of caffeine and then tons of sugar from having the sweet to go with things. You've got that double whammy then, haven't you? Um, I can drink green tea till quite late in the evening and I'm okay with that, but I tend to make it very weak that week. See, the, the important thing with all of these is to experiment with yourself. So unless I've had a client for at least a couple of sessions, I'm rarely able to give that kind of information because I don't know how they work during the day. But if you're ever unsure, try not having something for a few days and then building up and seeing how you feel on those. Um, a lot of it is about self-experimentation, but sometimes if you don't have the knowledge behind that, it can be quite difficult to self-experiment because you're not quite sure what the different variables are. Okay, what have we got? Feed your hormones. Um, in order to allow our hormones to work really, really well, they need certain building blocks. And actually, they include fat. We're told a lot of the time that the tide's turning on this one, definitely. But government guidelines always used to be avoid fat, particularly saturated fat. Every single hormone molecule we have requires some saturated fat and requires some um, cholesterol to be made. So if your hormone systems aren't working too well, it's probably worth adding a little bit of saturated fat. Uh, you're definitely going to be looking at some nut berries, I say, rather than fruit. Berries are much, much higher in the antioxidants that we need, and far less sugar than berries. Vegetables are great, but these are refined fats. So, butter, coconuts, avocados, olive oil, and even old-fashioned lard or dripping to cook them all help to just let our hormone system, although it's okay, they can relax and that we don't need sugar. The more fat mm -hmm. I eat, the less I crave sugar. And that's a really important one to remember. Fat can not the stuff that you're making chips with. And if you've got really good levels of fat, it curbs your appetite a bit so you don't crave that sugar in the same way. So the easiest way to cut down the sugar is to increase the amount of fat that you have. Any questions on that one? Um, what about vegans on that one? <laughs> They can have extra coconut oil, they can have olive oil, they can have avocado. So they can't have avocado. It's not technically vegan. And we're going to support the rates. 
it's, uh, because it's, uh, because uh, bees are used to keep in front of the oh, station okay. it's oh, okay. not strictly so the super strict vegan is probably not touching many avocados coconut milk is still right with that one uh, I think it's technically okay with that excellent, phew, they have there's a few people with them, right, of course how do you ask them that's Okay, we have a hellish problem trying to balance between sugar levels and its fat levels. <laughs> Here's the tricky bit. So, cholesterol is something that our bodies produce to actually heal its own state. So what happens is, one of the, often when we're having extra sugar, it causes inflammation in our body, particularly in things like blood vessels. When you have that inflammation happening, small little tears and cracks can appear. So what our body does is it makes extra cholesterol to make like plasters to cover those bits. So when we've got narrowing arteries, it's because our body's going, hey, up, there's, there's too much inflammation here, we've got these little cracks. We're essentially making plasters to cover those cracks. And those plasters can get thicker and thicker and thicker. So what happens is, the high cholesterol in our bodies is actually generally caused by having too much sugar in our systems. Because the high cholesterol is not from what you've eaten, it's from what your body's actually trying to make. Which makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah, and you will find that a lot of the time. Uh, our, our brains actually need huge amounts of cholesterol. So if we cut down on the cholesterol we have, our brains just don't function so well. Uh, that's when you tend to get people with a lot more anxiety, a lot more depression. Those are usually when people are actually kind of trying to cut back on their cholesterol levels. They can be really, really useful. But the sugar, however, is more likely to cause trouble than those fat levels. How long do you think about it? A little bit, yeah. Uh, anything else on the your hormones? Let's flip on, we've got 10 minutes. Right. <coughs> That's something the truth is. Uh, so you all know, the autistic brain is significantly more prone to stress than the non-autistic brain. Anyone got any problems with that one? I think we probably all agree most of us here are going to get more stress than most people. But environmental stresses, so those are the things we talked about before, particularly sensory ones, or the way that we are trying to behave to be like other people, or when people keep changing plans, all those things can cause a lot of stress. Also the internal ones, which could be from dietary factors. Those will all cause stress that will allow our bodies to release maybe make more cortisol, or maybe more adrenaline, causes all those hormone patterns to have more trouble. The more ways we can find to avoid these stresses, the better. And that really, really does depend on the person. So for me, it would mean finding a diet that's quite high in really good fat and cutting back on sugar. It means every time I've done something stressful, which for me could be like having to go to a supermarket to give myself several hours off afterwards. If I've been out to meet with friends, I'll give myself a day off the next day to actually recover from that. I can do this to be fine. Tomorrow is my sleeping day from having done this. Um, what are the triggers particularly? It really depends on the person. Some people will need different things to keep themselves in a more even key. But when we have less environmental stresses, we will have less of those little peaks of high cortisol, pushing those sugar levels up, and then the insulin and have to get those levels back up again. So if the volume is not possible for those stresses, then do give yourself plenty of recovery time afterwards. Most of you probably here will know that. When I'm doing talks for parents of the autistic children, that can be quite an issue, but they haven't actually realised how much recovery time children will need after they've done something that hurts going to the doctors or having had a day out with friends or something, but they may need two or three days to recover afterwards. Have most of you not found here found that you've needed extra recovery time if you've done something? Most people. Yes. We recently did a lot of that after this group. Uh, people can have a time to get out some of the resources. Go home and sleep. How many people will be sleeping after the session? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really hope to see my chain steps on the way back. <laughs> Keeping sleep schedule. I'm, this I know to particularly for my daughters at home. So if I allow them to sleep in much more. Oh, hello there. I'm sorry. If you have to have a day's sleep after doing something, for instance, oh, can you shout a little bit for me? <coughs> if you have to have a day's sleep after doing something that you found stressful, how do you fit a normal lifestyle in working? Yeah. It's <laughs> having the combination of things together that allows this situation to be less stressful than they might not be. So the quicker 
the more of those that those we've been through, yeah. the more of those that we can gradually start to get into our lives, the less recovery time we're likely to need. Does that help? Yeah. So last year I was working part time, and a lot of those things were not going that well for me, uh, and so I was doing at least half a day sleep for every half a day's work. I've got a lot of these things in place now. I'm sleeping at the right times. I'm not having sugar. Um, I've got the light sorted out in my household, which means that I can do two days full at university and I'm not needing to sleep the next day. So it really depends on how you're able to get those things in so you need less recovery time. But do recognise that if a lot of things are not working well, you're likely to need a lot more recovery time. So, with sleep schedules, um, I've just realised it's on there and I keep turning around to read it. It's right there, I've got a prompt and I'm nearly the last slide. Um, if my daughters sleep in, say an hour later than they might normally do at the weekend, getting up on Monday morning is so much more difficult. It doesn't mean I go in and I shout at them and make them get out of bed because that would be cruel. But I do make sure that the weekend, particularly in the winter, I still open their curtains even if they're not awake yet. So they've got that light coming in so that their body's already known to keep that cortisol cycle going the same. Um, for me, I find it a lot easier if I don't sleep in the weekends. It means that in the evenings at the weekends, I'm still going to bed at the same time. It means I don't have to readapt on Monday morning. It makes a huge difference. And also, if you're going to bed a lot after midnight, that's exactly the time when your cortisol levels are trying to go up to get you ready for the morning so you're able to wake. Everything's a gradual process. So if you remember, it's a higher eight in the morning, it goes down, 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 down. After about midnight, those levels are going to start coming up again. So if we're going to bed at the times when our cortisol levels are starting to rise, it can be a lot harder to get to sleep. Any questions on sleep schedules? Just wondering how you do that when it's in the job job, especially job. I wake up at the same time, I try to go to bed at the same time as I could. I'm virtually fast asleep by that same o'clock. It's kind of stressful. If you're going to bed earlier, actually, it's not such a problem. It's when people are going to bed a lot later on some nights than they would normally that it can actually cause a few issues. Um, people do tend. So, I don't know about you, but for me personally, if I go to sleep an hour or two earlier than I might normally, I'll still wake up at the same time in the morning. So the difference is, if I normally go to bed at half nine, and I'm awake at about six, if I go to bed at eight o'clock, I'll still sleep until about six, because I need that extra sleep, but it won't have actually upset my sleep schedule. I think it's that got a choice of when you Pardon? You don't get a choice of... You don't get that choice. It's basically, a come to sleep. <laughs> You're asleep. Okay, yeah. I lie down, have my, have my dinner, and then basically That's not coming for a longer time to go to, to bed to sleep. But it basically I'm asleep before that time comes. I'm waking then midnight to Oh, I see, I got you. Okay. So that can be sometimes if you wake up in the middle of the night, uh, sometimes it's actually because again your cortisol's done a little peak, it's gone, oh hang on, sugar levels have gone a little bit low, let's get them back up again. So that often, if you wake in the night, it's because your blood sugar levels have gone a little bit low. So I've told your body you're in an emergency situation and your body's trying to wake up again. And again, the more you're able to add a little bit more good healthy fats into your diet and remove the sugar, that's less likely to happen because we don't have that pattern going with cortisol and sugar. But it's getting all the things in gradually. I say nobody's going to be able to go home and put all those things into practice and then a week later find they're sleeping fine and they have no stress issues and they're not craving sugar. It doesn't work quite that easily. But if I say if there's any one of those bits that somebody can get in, that does make a bit of difference. Oh, and we're up yet. So we're on questions. We've got about two minutes. Any more questions? Hello. Um, just on uh, real fats, there's um, canola oil, the cold pressed uh, canola oil in the supermarket. Is that okay? Because I avoid canola oil actually. Um, it's not got a great balance of the essential fatty acids that are in it. So even if you've got the cold pressed one, it's not such a great one. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? We've got another half an hour off the break. Yeah, do. 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 Y